Shalom and welcome to Israel Vision's People and Places, an in-depth interview show. Today's guest is Dr. Randall Booth, the chairman of the Jerusalem School of the Synoptic Gospels. Dr. Booth is an American who's been residing in Israel for now 30 years and he's a renowned scholar of the Second Temple period and an expert in both Greek and Hebrew and is well known for his scholarly research in the field of linguistics and Bible translation. Dr. Booth resides in Jerusalem, as I said, and with his wife and two lovely married daughters with a grandchild on the way. Congratulations. Thank it's you. a joy to have you with us today, Randall. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. A big joy. And I can just hear some of our viewers saying, what does synoptic gospels mean? And after answering that, would you tell us about your school? Okay. Uh, synoptic gospels. Easy answer. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, the answer that explains why the name synoptic, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the same general outline. They are presenting the life of Jesus um, relatively in the same trajectory, and so they look at things together. Synoptic means looking together, and, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke have had that name since I don't know when. Uh, John is a different presentation. He's looking from a different perspective, and so he doesn't line up uh, with the same stories in the same order. Or the chronology. Or, exactly. Yeah. So um, it, it's a different perspective. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Synoptic Gospels. And what have you found out in the School of the Synoptic Gospels? Uh, uh, a lot. <laughs> and and we, have, we answer that in five minutes. No. Okay, well, first of all, in terms of school, I need to clarify so people know that we're talking about a school like in a, uh, a way of research. It's, it's how we approach the Gospels, how we study the Gospels. It's scholars working together, Jewish and Christian scholars, working together, studying the Synoptic Gospels together. It's a school in the sense of uh, a school of thought, not in terms of a building where students come, although many of us teach. I teach uh, other uh, professors that participate in these uh, joint researches will teach, but, but the Jerusalem School is a, is a way of approaching, a way of studying. Yes, and Randall, what I, would, I think our audience would be interested to know is that the Renaissance of Hebrew as a language has made a tremendous contribution to the ability to understand um, the context in which those Gospels were, were presented and, and uh, the stories that's, of those Gospels. That's, that's what's given birth to the Jerusalem School. Is so without the Renaissance of Hebrew, we wouldn't be able to have this. Without, without Hebrew, there would be no Jerusalem School. And maybe I can use that as a starting point of explaining uh, where, where it's come from. Uh, uh, maybe should I, should I start with how, he, do, how much do people know about the Renaissance of Hebrew? I'm sure they don't know, and did Jesus okay. ever speak Hebrew? Okay, well, that's, I should start there. Uh, Hebrew was a living language back in uh, David's day and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and what some people don't realize is it remained a living language all through what we call the Second Temple period, from Jeremiah all the way to Jesus. Uh, the people went to Babylon, and when they came back after the exile, they didn't get rid of Hebrew, they added Aramaic. So the population had two languages. The official language was Aramaic to deal with the Persians and business and foreigners and, and, and the high people, and Hebrew was still around. And the prophets were still giving God's message out to the people in Hebrew. The Malachi, all of, um, I don't know, a third of the, of the Hebrew Bible is written after the exile. All of the, you know, the chronicles, the um, different uh, prophets. History books. Zechariah, Haggai. Uh, this is all written during the Second Temple period, and they wrote it in Hebrew uh, because they wanted to communicate. The Dead Sea Scrolls are all written in Hebrew. Now that was found about 50 years ago that uh, woke up scholarship. People said, oh, we would never have predicted that we'd find a whole library full of Hebrew writings from the end of the Second Temple period. The whole book of Isaiah, for example. Well, the whole book of Isaiah uh, 
Hebrew Bible, but, but their own writings. They were writing uh, rules about uh, how should we eat. If somebody joins our group, uh, when do we accept him? What does he have to do before we, before we accept him? And what will he give us to join? And all of this is all written out in Hebrew. Uh, explanations about uh, what the Bible prophecies meant in their day was all written out in Hebrew. Now, as a Hebrew scholar, can you read that easily today? Of course. It's of just course. like picking up the newspaper? It's like picking up an old newspaper. <laughs> but exactly. Uh, it's, it's all part of the same language. Now, they were writing and people were speaking, and the early rabbis in the first century, we've got a lot of rabbis that were teaching, and all of their recorded teachings f for the common people, again, how do you live? You know, when do you pray this? What should you do? What happens if this, you know, if, if I'm growing some, a field of this kind of crop and another person has this kind of crop over there, what happens? And, and what about, the, what about uh, the land in the middle? And, and if he builds a fence and if I build a fence? And, so uh, how all did, of this was in Hebrew. So where did the Greek influence on the New Testament? That's come Alexander. Uh, Alexander the Great took over the Middle East uh, and set up, uh, well, set up an empire, which then broke down into four pieces, and the Greek language spread all over, which added a third language to the land of Israel. So they had, they had Aramaic as the official language with, under the Persian rule. They had Hebrew as their tribal language. Their, that's their local language. And then with, uh, with the conquest of Alexander, Greek became the administrative language, the official language, the prestige language, the language you would deal with with those outside. Even the Romans, when they were here, if you wanted to talk to the uh, Roman governor, you would speak Greek, uh, not Latin. The, the army would deal with the local people in Greek. So what happened then? Here you have a kind of an anomalous situation where people are trying to describe the life in the time of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels in a language that isn't their, their mother tongue. Correct. They're, uh, they're writing Greek. Greek would be like the English of today. Um, actually, the languages used in Israel today are very similar to, uh, to 2,000 years ago. Today, the international language is English. Arabic was the official language of the area, and Hebrew is still the local language. Uh, there was a 17-year hiatus where it was a second language for everybody. Now it's a first language again. Uh, but the, having three languages, uh, a local language, a business language, and an international prestige language was around in Jesus' day with Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. And it's around today with English, Arabic, and Hebrew. And Russian has been added in. <laughs> and Russian has been added in a little bit. <laughs> and uh, recently. Recently. You see Russian on some of the buildings. That's true. Uh, back to Jesus and how does this change things. Uh, maybe a hundred years ago there were scholars who were trying to argue that Hebrew was an artificial language in Jesus' day. Uh, the, the rabbinic material was artificial and a man named Segal, 1908, wrote an article showing that the features of what was called Mishnaic Hebrew, this was the local language of, of that, or the, the low-level language, the spoken language of that time, uh, it had features that cannot be explained by that theory, that it was a natural growth and development, not of people that, w that didn't speak Hebrew, that were trying to, but in fact a natural development that had, that had gone on over the centuries, that had features that weren't Aramaic, that weren't Biblical Hebrew, they were just Mishnaic Hebrew. Could you say that Jesus was uh, trilingual? Then? Jesus was trilingual then, exactly. Uh, every expectation that he would have... Uh, he would certainly have known Aramaic and Hebrew, and there's no reason why he wouldn't have been one of the uh, probably majority that knew some Greek if he was uh, a builder, a tecton, uh, helping his father as a teenage boy, let's say. Uh, Nazareth isn't far from Tsipori, which was just being built when he was a teenager, and uh, what would be more natural than, than his dad gets a contract and they're off building a house or or, uh, or furniture or, mm -hmm. or something in nearby Tsipori in Greek. Can you give us some examples from the, from the New Testament that we're reading today, some phrase that really doesn't make any sense to our everyday world? Sure. Uh, 
the, but was a Hebrew colloquialism. Sure, sure. Well, the you know how does Hebrew how does Hebrew play? You fine. So Jesus also spoke Hebrew. Uh, whoopie do. What is you know what difference yeah. does it make? And the difference is is it it gives us a another perspective. You triangulate and you know exactly where you are. It gives us now another perspective to go in and look at the words of Jesus and see how they fit against his background. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the Gospels, in Matthew, you have Jesus saying, whatever you bind will have been bound, whatever you loose will have been loosed. Uh, no explanation. Uh, well, that's one clue. No explanation, that means that means that Jesus expected that everybody, everybody would understood, understood and everybody did but when we're looking from outside what does it mean you have people they look they look through their bible they say oh here's a here's a parable about somebody tying up a strong man that must be what it means cuz look it says tie up so so whatever you bind will be bound so it must be some kind of somehow we have to tie up the devil uh, that's that's a good guess but it isn't from within the culture. Within the culture, an idiom used thousands of times was to bind and to loose. To bind means to forbid, to loose means to permit. It was making a decision about what is right and wrong. And, and that's at the heart of spirituality. In Hebrews it says that the mature are those who through practice have learned how to distinguish what is right and what is wrong. And Jesus uh, is passing on a responsibility that is awesome. Imagine turning over to human beings that seem to mess up everywhere and saying, God's going to give you the, the authority to decide what is right and wrong. Yes, and the key to the kingdom. And the key to the kingdom. And God wants to work with you guys on this. Uh, that's awesome. That's horribly. I mean, it's, it's, it's a... It's a We've, we've been working for 2,000 years now, uh, not always getting it right, scrambling, scrambling, but God's promised to work with us. Anyway, the Hebrew perspective lets us know exactly what Jesus meant. Do you have another one you can give us? I know that people would be very interested. Well, you can see things. Um, Jesus asks someone, what is the... Um, uh, well, a man comes to Jesus and says... Uh, what is the big commandment in the law? That's Matthew's wording. And Jesus, like a rabbi, says, well, how do you read? What's written in the Torah? Two questions. And then the guy answers and says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He's joined two things together that was uh, very clear for the audience, and Jesus was expecting this answer. This wasn't something totally new to the culture as we... As we see in Luke, when Jesus asks him, well, you tell me. You know, I know you know this. Come on, tell me. So the guy says, well, here, this is what you meant? He says, exactly, that's what I meant. And how did those two get together? Well, ve'ahavta only occurs uh, four times in the whole Hebrew Bible. And one of the rabbinic ways of, of um, bringing things together is when you find rare forms of words, you look and see if the verses might somehow help interpret each other. So here, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and, and uh, strength. Deuteronomy 6, something prayed every morning and every evening to receive the kingdom of heaven, uh, had started off with this word ve'ahavta, which links with the uh, Leviticus 19, and you shall love your neighbor who is like you. And so they would join those two together and say, hmm, isn't there some kind of poetic exegesis going, he, going on here where in God's word he's planned for the one to interpret the other? And that's how we get it. And so learning about the culture, we can see some of the mindset and see some of the, the way Jesus was interacting with his audience in full color and in three dimension now. Randall, thank you so much for that wonderful information you've passed on to us, real nuggets that are going to help us in our uh, studies of the scriptures. And uh, I know you're not going to be here just for the first time. We would love to have you as a regular guest to share this with our viewers. And if any of you out there would like to have more information about the outstanding, exciting uh, research work that they're doing at the Jerusalem School, then you can look it up on the web, www.jerusalemperspective.com. And this is uh, Jay and Maridel just saying, 
We're so glad you could be with us today, and we're wishing you shalom, shalom from, from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. This week's Fact or Fantasy portion, I want to share with you some behind the scenes information that makes the birth of the State of Israel so very significant. At that time, the United Nations were deliberating, it was 1947, concerning a two state solution in the Middle East, exactly as it is today, and they came up with the concept to give the Palestinians a portion and to give the Jews a portion. And a very important development because it was the mother of all UN resolutions that resulted. It was number 181 concerning the Middle East crisis and the Arabs would not accept this solution. The Jews would have accepted it and it seemed also a suicidal development for the Jewish people because the tiny piece of land that they were being given and yet they were willing to accept it. We always forget that the Muslim nations would not accept it and why? Why was that the case? Well, I want to show you this clip now to give you an overview of all the currents that were coming together at that time. And uh, it was a pivotal point in world history. The partition was linked with the very idea of a Jewish state. And we were vitally interested in gaining international recognition. Arabs saw partition as a step towards Jewish statehood. If recognition came, it was war. So nobody thought about a state, really a state, because we knew a state means war. And nobody wanted a war. Israeli statesman Abba Iban was representing Israel in the United Nations at the time as a young diplomat, and he recalls. Everything happened on that day. So many currents came together. There was a British decision to move out. There was an Arab decision to move in. There was an Israeli decision to proclaim statehood in spite of the... Uh, resistance that this would incur. There was an American decision to recognize Israel. There was a United Nations decision not to get in the way, not to rescind partition. And I'll never forget how, uh, while the United Nations was talking about partition, uh, two things happened which uh, made that discussion marginal. First, an announcement from Tel Aviv, the state of Israel has been established. And we therefore said to the United Nations, gentlemen, it's, what you're saying is very interesting. But in the meantime, the issue has been decided. And 11 minutes afterwards, a message from Washington that President Truman, uh, whose uh, representatives were arguing against Jewish statehood in the General Assembly, uh, had in fact given us recognition uh, within the quarter of an hour of our birth. The euphoria of the newborn state of Israel was short-lived. As on the very next day, May the 15th, 1948, six Arab armies attacked and they attack this fledgling state of Israel. And so next week, I want to take you behind the scenes in Fact or Fantasy with the late General Uzi Narkis and the pain that he was going through as a young officer in the Israeli Defense Forces when he had to give up Jerusalem, the city of his birth, which he'd loved so much. You'll not want to miss it next week. This is Jay Rawlings reporting to you, Fact or Fantasy. Shalom, shalom. What a beautiful day it is. And here we are together, and I am so glad to have heard from you via email and via your personal letters. What a gift to us as a family here living in the hills of Benjamin. Today I want to talk about trauma. I want to talk about those, especially teens, who would love to be anyone other than who they are. It happens to all of us at one point or another in our lives, and there are answers that we can find without mother and father pushing us to go to a doctor or even uh, a psychiatrist or a whatever. If you will be still and listen for the still small voice out of that confusion, out of that darkness, and that turmoil, will come a voice, a gentle voice, a loving voice, a voice that's, that is for you, a voice that will call you words of endearment. It will not be a voice that will cut you to the quick or put you down 
or tell you you're not good enough or you will never succeed. That is the wrong voice. But the principle here is to know the heart of God for you as a person, just like you are. So often when we're not pleased with ourselves, or if something terrible has happened to us, or we've gotten in over our heads and we've become perhaps involved in some way with something that's very sinister, it could be anything in life today, you can stop and you can cry out in your honesty and believe me, the Lord will be right there for you. When we're not pleased with ourselves, we want to be somebody else. We want to look like somebody else, dress like somebody else, talk like somebody else, and try to think like somebody else. I'll never forget when I was a young nursing student on a psychiatric ward, I was given the care of a young girl who was 15. She was in what is called a catatonic state. That means her body was completely stiff and almost frozen, like she was uh, crippled. And she appeared to be unconscious and was on a, an intravenous drip. The psychiatrist said to me, Maridel, your job for the next month is going to be to mother this child. And he, he said, watch me now because we're going to wake her up. She was in what appeared to be a coma and he spoke into her ear and he said, go ahead and die. I know that you don't want to die, but you go ahead and die. And I was shocked. Wow, what a way to speak to a poor girl. And do you know what happened? This frozen little girl, undernourished, anorexic, she woke up sobbing, absolutely sobbing. She wasn't in a coma at all. She was in a psychotic state of total rejection of life. The doctor called me. He said, come and sit here. And I sat on the bed. I got a blanket and I cuddled her as though she were a three-month-old baby. And then I got a baby bottle and I fed her a baby bottle. And my job was to bring that child up. I was only there for a month, so I had the privilege of working with her to bring her to the stage of about a one-year-old baby. But my job was to hold her and cuddle her and sing into her ear and speak into her ear about the love of God because it heals. The love of God heals the mind. The love of God heals the soul. It gave her a reason to come out of her cave. I'm sure that I'm speaking to someone today who has been there, who has felt just that low. And my word to you is, come out of your cave. There is light, there is hope for your future, says the Lord. And if you can't find somebody to help, you ask him and he'll come. You listen for that still small voice and you do what it says.